Okay, <clears throat> this is the pre-class video for class number 10. On um, last class, we talked about humanism. Corliss Lamont, we had a reading about the humanist tradition and how much our founding fathers embraced it. They were definitely humanists, um, Christian humanists, <clears throat> but they accepted into our country other kinds of humanists, as well as people from religious traditions that were persecuted in England and elsewhere because, part, partly because they were anti-intellectual religious traditions. But basically, our founders just wanted everybody to come well, you know, for religious freedom, as long as you don't bring that into your role as a citizen, <laughs> okay, um, that's it. Just separate your consciousness. Now, some of your religious training does fit with the humanism that you have to have when you're acting as a citizen. But if it doesn't fit, keep it out <laughs> because... Democracy depends upon believing that people can take care of their practical affairs rationally and collectively. They can take care of their collective needs and problems. Um, they meet together at a town hall meeting. So the town hall meeting is, is secular. The church is sacred, right? You just separate them. Anyway, so uh, for class tomorrow, I would like you to relook at something we didn't cover, uh, we didn't get to at the class today, which is on this. Um, okay, so the, the, it's the previous day's um, attachment called UN Humanism Lamont Reading. And you start on page 18 and with the manifesto, Humanist Manifesto of 1933. And you read that, it's four or five, it's not six pages. Then the Humanist Man Manifesto of 1973. Um, and that's what, seven, eight pages, oh, nine. Okay, and that's it. So I would like you to read that. Plus on the talking points here, I did list some of the main points of these humanist manifestos here. Here's the Humanist Manifesto, um, 1933. So I would like you to think about how have these manifestos changed? Because they'll tell you about how our culture has changed. And they'll also tell you about um, how humanism adapts to change. So changes going on in the world and in the country humanism would adapt and change because humanism is not a doctrine. It's just sort of an attitude. And so the idea is that the attitude is that we can use our reason to um, cultivate humanity, to help each other out, to flourish. But in order to do that, we can't have any one set doctrine. We have to adapt. And so the only thing that humanism asks is that you use your reason to help improve the human condition. You can also, that can be consistent with your faith. It could be even demanded of your faith that if you, have, if you believe in God, you better use your reason to fix the world. <laughs> so, um, but for some humanists, it's instead of religion. For some people just disagree. So you have to figure out what you think. Um, religion can be anti-science, anti but it shouldn't be. So 
we need a statement and religious humanists. So this one is focused more on religious uh, humanists. So you can be religious and still think the universe is self-existing and not created. That's interesting. Uh, humans are part of nature. There isn't a split between nature and humanity. Um, it's the product of gradual evolution. We've had a social evolution. Um, and modern science leads to the rejection of supernatural or cosmic guarantees of hu human values. All right, so it just rejects a supernatural intervention on the, the scientific patterns that we understand with our reason. So, um, so these religious humanists um, want to integrate the scientific spirit with religion in some sense. And so they reject more progressive views of deism and theism and modernism, okay? Now, in 1973, there was another one written because the people felt it needed to be corrected. Again, everyone as a humanist is always adapting it anyway, but they wanted to come out with a statement. Now, this was when I was in college, actually. So what's happened is technology is not necessarily going to save us. Um, it's also causing ecological damage. I was very aware of this in 1968, and it was depressing um, because I just felt overwhelmed. The world was heading in the wrong direction for environmental sustainability. But I just decided then that I would always be aware of it. I would always support sustainability, but I would still have to live my life. So um, this is what started to emerge in the 1970s and 60s, really. Um, and then also between 19, the importance of um, recognizing the possibility for totalitarianism, totalitarianism, even with a lot of technology. Um, but humanism rejects people reverting to the end times and sort of explaining it as this is the end times in the book of Revelation. So just um, convert to Christianity and you'll be saved and the world is, is just going to rot, you know, it's gonna end in fire, um, but that's okay, as long as you believe. That's what a humanist will reject. Um, and then they wanna fuse reason with compassion. Uh, there's many kinds of humanism. And then they want a new view of religion that encourages, um, yeah, okay, that encourages independence rather than dependence. Um, so if you remember in the Euthyphro dialogue, well, what is our relationship to the gods? Is it one of master slave or what? Is it a business deal? You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. You know, if I kiss up to you, you'll be, give me a stable family and society and I'll go to heaven, right? there just against that. So they think you need to use your reason. Um, and this escapism, right? Fatalism, escapism, turning away from fixing the world is uh, wrong. That's what they reject. And they're also starting to, they reject both capitalism and communism, but they embrace a middle ground between those. So I would call it regulated capitalism. Um, nothing human is alien, okay, to the religious. So this would be a religion that's, that is humanistic. Um, all right, the goal is complete realization of personality. So that is Aristotle's view, I think, of flourishing. Um, all right. 
face crises, and it also condemns acquisition and profit mode of society. So it condemns greed. It's not like humanists are degenerate and greedy or self-indulgent. They really are serious about um, living out high standard of virtue. Um, okay. So let me go over here to the main reading for tonight is this one. Um, okay, it starts and it has a summary of the humanist manifestos. Um, and here's a, then it adds for a year 2000, a planetary humanism. So now the emphasis is on thinking about the planet and more and more environmental issues are becoming a bigger and bigger issue over time, like I knew they would 52 years ago. Um, all right, and so you can look at that. Um, the benefits of technology, I mean, how they deal with naturalism, science and naturalism, and then technology, which is, you know, it's technology and its relation to nature is very fraught at this moment. You know, some fossil fuel industry just keeps exploiting it. Bill Gates is trying to engineer, like sucking carbon out of the air. He's trying to figure out how to use technology to do that. Um, okay, so a new global agenda, planetary institution. So we have to think globally, right? Here's the um, 2000, here's the main principles. So this is much shorter than the earlier ones, but it keeps trying to get to the essence. And then everyone takes that and adapts it to what fits for their particular project in life. Here's another one of the writers of the manifesto is defending what he wrote. And he's commenting on um, some of the criticisms of it, how it's been assimilated or not assimilated into the culture at large. Um, let's see. The Quakers are interesting because um, they, they emphasize the Sermon on the Mount as the essence. And then they were, they integrated that with all sorts of non-deistic religions. So the Sermon on the Mount is the highest ideal for a way of life. Um, so that's kind of their focus. Um, and they work for a better world. I, my husband's parents are Quakers, and I did attend a Society of Friends for a while when I lived in Philadelphia. Um, and I did actually have a, a gathering of friends when I was there at Lyon. Uh, not very many people came. Most of the time, no students came, but I just offered it. Um, Okay, so that's that. Then here's the anti, here's the anti-humanist position. So it's on page 14 of um, this document. So I want you to look at it and think about it, okay? Because you will run into these kinds of arguments all the time. There's just lots of stuff going on and it's very polarizing. That's what sort of I agonize about is can't we just sit down and reason together? And lots of times to me, well, okay, so somebody is against human cloning. Well, first of all, I, I tend to think like, well, it's going to go on anyway, but that's not a justification. It's just that can you start making a distinction between some kinds of cloning and other kinds of cloning? Can you make a distinction between what should be legal, what should be illegal? 
I just want people to start making distinctions in terms of what's possible. Is it possible to get legislators to vote laws against cloning or against some kinds of cloning? <laughs> you know? um, so that's whenever somebody says cloning good, cloning bad, it's just it just isn't the way the world works. And it isn't it isn't what's best. And it also isn't the way people actually behave. Um, so I would, you know, and in the spirit of Aristotelian practical wisdom, let's just try to figure out how to find some middle ground, how to move forward, how to agree to disagree. But most of all, don't polarize and end up with a strong man because the because the citizens can't get along with each other. I, it's also important that I'm very disappointed in intellectuals because too many of them are also polarizing figures. And it's just, that is really irresponsible. If you're educated, you should not polarize. You should always want to talk with people because you should care more absolutely the most about preserving free speech and free and open discussion free scientific inquiry that should be your number one priority and in order to do that you have to talk to people and you have to not polarize okay um all right so this person is criticizing, they, they think the humanists are too utopian. And um, all right, and it's hates God and cultural sewage, and it, they're the cause of all the degeneracy of, um, I don't know, the young people or the divorce and all this wonderful stuff, collapse of the family. Um, it's all because of the humanists. All right. All right. And um, okay, so this is what they mock out the goal of the perfection of humanity uh, on earth, right? And, all right. So one extreme is that we have to depend on God. And we shouldn't do anything to fix things. The other extreme is forget about God. We can do everything. Well, you know what? That's not the way things are going to operate. There's always going to be people trying to do something. So let's just talk about, well, what something should each of us do? <laughs> um, because even people that say turn to God, turn to God, if they get sick, they're definitely going to go to the doctor. <laughs> so they use a lot of health care. Well, health care depends on accepting evolution, because if it's really God that's causing you to be sick, none of our knowledge of health care, that wouldn't exist, right? Or certainly you shouldn't use it. But all of it depends upon evolution. That's pre presupposed that the patterns that you see are going to continue or they're going to adapt. And so you can make this drug or that therapy on the assumption that there isn't a supernatural God who comes in there and throws in a wrench all the time. So on the one hand, you know, to reject science uh, and turn to faith at one extreme, it's terrible. But the other extreme to think science is salvation is also, it's just not at all the way people operate. Um, because if you can't convince people in their character, okay, so if you have all the science. I read a whole book about how terrible sugar is. It's an addiction. It makes people sick. It's destroying America blah, blah. There's all this information. You got all the science. Is that going to solve the problem? No, because you can't get people 
to, to stop eating it, right? They need to completely reform their habits. And so science alone is not going to save us. And you can't just keep telling people and telling them again and telling them again. There has to be some value system and some kind of moral character that you can train yourself to want to eat healthy food. How do you do that? You can't do that just with science. You have to do that with compassion, understanding. Um, there's also the problem of the economics. If you really don't have a lot of money, and if you buy an apple that costs a dollar and you can buy a McDonald's Happy Meal that costs a dollar, obviously you're gonna buy cheap fast food because you don't have enough money or time. Well, then you get sick, right? So the doctor will tell you, ah, don't do that. You ruin your body and blah, blah. Well, you're a doctor, you get paid. I don't have enough money. So how are you going to deal with the economics behind the, our problems with our diet? So again, science alone will not solve it. So we should work together on character development, on teaching people to want to do what is cons consistent with the science, but also an economic system. We should have an economic system that rewards sustainability and uh, healthy eating and all sorts of other things. So that's where we could start rather than trying to think that either religion or science will save us. Um, so here's another one. He's commenting on the second one, 1973. Um, and again, he's emphasizing that, is, that it claims that perfection is possible. Well, certainly there would be a lot of people who signed it who either it doesn't say that or that's not the part of it that they care about. They just want us to head in that direction of using our reason. Um, okay, so another thing is we can control our environment. Well. This is not because to be arrogant, this is because we're destroying it. And so we can become sustainable, right? Um, conquer poverty, all right. Well, that again, it's so extreme. So the Humanist Manifesto is extreme. So it lends itself to have somebody coming in there and criticizing, right? Um, let's see. Uh, modify our behavior. So social programs are trying to modify behavior. So you reward people who eat healthy by giving them, I don't know, some kind of a vouchers to get healthy food or I don't know. But you know the way people try to social engineer. You try to set up society so people get rewarded for cooperating. Otherwise, you said societies will be set up that you get, uh, that you get, you react, right? You're in a situation of fear and you're competitive. So if you remember, Michael McCullough said, both competition, revenge, aggression, and cooperation, they're both natural. It's just that a humanist will want to structure the society to focus on the cooperation. And a religious person who hates humanism would want to say, would be more, I'm a lot more neutral in how much to intervene and how much to try and mold people. So basically when that happens, people do get molded, but more by fear, by um, a shrinking middle class. If you don't do anything, you're gonna have a lot of people in desperate situations and then they'll react. But supposedly if you turn to God, then it won't be a problem. So it's complicated. And, um, and here are the debates, right? There's lots of debates. Um, yeah, there's a example 
somebody wants to construct their own son. Well, yeah, that's crazy. But, and, and I'm sure Bill Gates wants to do some stuff that might seem pretty outrageous. And there is a lot of technology that was supposed to work and it turns out to have terrible side consequences. But does that mean we shouldn't, he shouldn't even be trying. And that's where I, to me, I don't like his stuff on, he's really in favor of genetically modified uh, seeds everywhere in the world. Whereas I think you can argue that, well, over here, yes. Over here in India, there's a program for natural processes for farming. If it works, leave it alone, right? Over here, you might have some other problem. So it shouldn't be absolutely. Everything should be GMO. Nothing should be GMO, sorry. But what about the engineering? What about getting the carbon out? So uh, an anti-humanist would probably call Bill Gates one of those awful humanists that thinks they can construct everything. But on the other hand, Bill Gates is what he's doing is based all on research about that life on Earth is going to end unless we start doing something really, really soon. Um, uh, all right. So, so the idea is that it's arrogance. It's exactly what Adam and Eve, the fall of Adam and Eve, they tried to replace God. So I just think you have to, you have to think about it, right? Um, let's see. I guess that's the main, the main issue there. And they certainly, you know, for Mr. Dugan, it's just obvious, right? It's just obvious right in front of your face that humanism is what the devil you know, told Adam and Eve to do, think for themselves, <laughs> um, replace God. All right, so now you have to worry about that. Then, um, not for tomorrow, but for the day after that, you're going to be assigned to find your own favorite kind of humanism. And so, and then report in on it. So this is just to give you an idea that there are lots of kinds of humanism. Um, and I will ask you after the day after tomorrow to read humanist psychology, a little article on that, and an article on Christian humanism. But these are some examples of what students have brought before. Um, and they're all interesting, and I like reading them. Um, all right. OK, and then, yeah, that's that. Then over here is what happened after 9-11. So that anti-humanism really took off after 9-11 because people were saying God allowed this to happen because our country was being taken over by um, all these nasty people, the pagans, which, you know, that's Aristotle's pagan. The abortionists, the feminists, the gays, the lesbians. Um, you helped this to happen. Um, then he, Pat Robertson, you're supposed to be nice, the Episcopalians, Presbyterians, the Methodists. Well, 85 of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were Episcopalians, and the vast majority. And then all of these, these three branches unite reason and faith. So what he's saying is we don't want to unite reason and faith. That's the Antichrist. Um, all right. Our goal is a Christian nation. We have a biblical duty. We are called by God to conquer this country. Uh, we don't want pluralism. Well, but our founders wanted pluralism, right? A nation of Christians is not a Christian nation. Right? You can have a nation that's predominantly Christian, but it's a secular state. When you are acting as a citizen, you're not bringing your religion in there. 
A Christian nation means that you want Christian doctrines to govern the legal system, the educational system, you know, every aspect of the culture. Okay. Um, here's uh, Huckabee. This is really hard to read. So he has these values, the sanctity of life. So he's against abortion, traditional marriage, free enterprise, and it's without regulations. It's just sort of free. Don't regulate capitalism at all. Um, government health care is against that. The empathy, I mean, it's okay. Missile defense. Now he's totally in favor of guns and bombs, all right? Because that's original sin and, and the state's function is to protect us against evildoers. And there's lots of evildoers. Okay. Um, no propping up the bank. So after the collapse of 2007, he did not want government to intervene. Um, it's never right to do wrong. All right. So that would be the abyss of socialism in Europe. Okay. Well, the argument is that if we hadn't propped up the banks, everybody would have suffered. You would have had a depression. Okay, people disagree on exactly um, how much to prop them up or how to set the thing up, lots of other stuff. But if to do nothing was to really end up with people, a lot of people in a very desperate, desperate situation, well, that's how we got the depression is that we didn't regulate capitalism. So this is basically, we didn't have enough regulations on housing def credit default swaps for housing and the economy collapsed. And um, so, but still Huckabee will emphasize free enterprise and no government intervention. Now that's, to me, that's crazy, right? It's too extreme. It isn't really what people want because they don't really know what the effect of that would be. Um, but anyway, the other one is socialism. Well, what is socialism? Well, having preschool and after school and good public education, good health care. And that's Europe, you know, the abyss of socialism. Well, Europe is also very secular, secular humanist. So, you know, it's up to you. You can think about that. I mean, I don't agree with some of the super secular, what I would call them super secular humanists in Europe. But I do think social programs are necessary. Um, at, in this day and age, people need education and healthcare. So here is the Pope. And going back to this, he would be a Christian humanist. He rejects religious bigotry. So he's very interfaith. Okay. And he rejects fundamentalism. So he advocates for a kind of humanistic religion. Uh, rejects party, partisan bickering. So he's very much against polarized political life in all over the world, right? He's, he's preaching to the world, the United Nations. Start addressing problems. The goal is the common good. Stop punishing immigrants. Um, don't run your foreign policy as might thinks right. Focus on the golden rule. Well, that's certainly consistent with every religion. Stop the global arms trade and the death penalty. Uh, address inequality by creating good jobs. So stop ignoring climate change. So a lot of these principles are perfectly consistent with humanism. Um, and then you can ask yourself, what, what do these anti-humanists, right? Are they, you know, I don't like to, they're all a bunch of religious bigots. No, they're not, right? That's where the polarizing comes in. And the, the parties, the political parties have associated themselves 
with with one or the other of these. And that's part of what's driving the, the polarization. Uh, how are we going to deal with immigration policy? Instead of having this huge polarized conversation, let's just get some policies in there. Um, how are we going to relate to other countries? Might makes right, are we going to try to have decent uh, peace tr treaties or interchanges, diplomacy to solve our problems? What about global arms trade? I mean, I know that um, there is there are people who are evangelicals and also pro-gun, right? No regulations on guns uh, within the country, but not all of them are like that. I mean, 80% plus want more basic background checks and uh, not selling to mentally ill people and things like that. So you should get over the polarization. It's not good. Then how do we create good jobs? By not regulating capitalism at all? Or by having a regulating it like the Europeans do? Or something in between? And given that we are who we are, it's going to be something in between. So let's just start talking about it. And then climate change is very important. How do we set up? How do we create laws, institutions? How do we develop attitudes and a culture that works towards sustainability? So, okay. So here's the difference in public policy. So there are so many huge differences and they're so polarizing. So one of them is the prayer in the public schools, teaching science, Apparently in Arkansas, if you're a biology teacher, you can choose whether to teach creationism or evolution. Um, what's the relation between facts and values? What character building, right? They should all agree on this, right? Both sides should agree on this. Um, all right. There should be no discrimination, right? Charitable giving, personal donations versus taxes. So the people who are, don't want capitalism regulated want to emphasize that when people get rich, then they give back through charitable giving, right? Being generous. Um, whereas people who advocate for forced redistribution of wealth would say something like, well, people need licensed counselors and therapists. They don't need volunteers or people with good intentions that don't have the skills. But you need taxes to pay people who have expertise to do these various things. Um, all right. So what about the laws? Abortion, legal or illegal, gun control euthanasia, capital punishment. So we went through this before, right? We on Euthyphro, we really disagree on these two sides disagree on so much of what's going on. Uh, tax structure, punishment of criminals, refugee resettlement, immigration, environmental protection, women's equality. Um, in international affairs, we disagree. How we should treat other countries, the UN, how much we should cooperate with the UN. Um, okay. So those are all questions about to ask yourself. And I do appreciate it when you, you know, you make those efforts. And this is do humanists promote an Aristotelian way of life. And you can go back over all those virtues if you want to. So the question there is, I want you to really, to really come in, you know, to class with opinions about, and I want you to pick out some stuff specifically from the reading. Like, what did you think of the 1933 manifesto? What did you think of the 1973? What did you think of the 2000? Did you notice that there was a shift? 
Do you care about that shift? What do you think today? What do you think a humanist would want to be saying today? Well, sustainability is number one, to give you a hint. Um, well, what do you think of that, right? Um, and how, in your own experience, do you do people talk like this? Do they do they have that animosity or not? And do people bring up these polarized issues? And how do you think we can find some middle ground and literally preserve our democracy? I don't want to sound alarmist, but I am. <laughs> I'm alarmist. Um, about the democracy and about the earth, the future of the earth. So, but I, that's me. All I'm doing as a teacher is trying to get you to figure out where you are on these things. <laughs>